nature not, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Today we'll go bird watching, tomorrow we'll catch toads The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things And I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case Open and shut No doubt about it I'm a nature nut Hi there. Well, here we are. It's the middle of summer. Canada Day has passed us by a couple of weeks back, 4th of July. It's not quite time yet for Saskatchewan Day, August the 7th. No kidding. That's what they call it in Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan Day. But the great news is today is Big Wet Rodent Day. For the first time ever, I might add. Now, what is Big Wet Rodent Day? It's July the 26th. Mark it on your calendar. Make sure to celebrate it from now on. It's a day when we take the time to celebrate, to express our joy at the mere existence of large semi-aquatic rodents like beavers and muskrats here in Canada. If you live in the States, you could celebrate the Aplodontia, the Nutria, even the Florida water rat. In South America, you could celebrate the Capybara, the biggest wet rodent of all. But I gotta warn you, if you're in Europe on Big Wet Rodent Day, you're gonna have a lot of trouble finding big wet rodents. There aren't that many left. And don't think you can get away with celebrating the water vole over there. That's a little wet rodent. We'll need a whole nother day for them. So, let's get on with it. The day is young. Let's go find some big wet rodents. place to look for big wet rodents is at a beaver pond like this one. How do we know that this is a beaver pond and not just an everyday pond? Well, for one thing, it's full of cut trees, beaver cut trees, like the one that I'm sitting on at this very moment. You can tell that this is a very recent beaver pond because there are still lots of willows and even some gigantic poplar trees that are standing out in the water, drowning. They are suffocating. They will soon be dead and in an old established beaver pond those trees would either have been cut down or they would have fallen down. The other very obvious sign that this is a real beaver pond is that big mound right there. That's a beaver lodge and they, they heap up sticks and mud and stuff like that. They make a tunnel into the lodge from underwater and they have a, a chamber inside where they live and sleep and do all their beaver things. On the outside Half of it is quite old looking with a lot of plants growing up from it. The other half is newly renovated with fresh sticks and fresh mud. And what probably happened here is that this used to be a very um, densely beaver populated place. Those beavers are gone and it's recently been recolonized by new beavers. If this is true, if this is a recolonized pond, we should find that the dam is fairly newly constructed as well. So let's go have a look at the beaver dam. Well, what do you know? Not just one newly built beaver dam, but two. There's another one back there. These guys have got a split level going. Isn't this incredible? These dams, they're made of freshly cut beaver cut twigs, mud, and there's some gravel and some rocks in here just for good measure. Very impressive animals. Oh, and look too, every night they put new stuff on the dam just so it doesn't leak too much. Look at that. <laughs> Amazing critters. I think it's absolutely unbelievable. Think about it. These are animals the size of an average dog and they're building these dams with nothing more than their teeth and their little paws and good old fashioned instinct and they've built two dams, they're holding back quite a few swimming pools worth of water, and they're living in it all year. Unbelievable. No wonder we admire them so much. 
by the time fur traders first came to North America, the European beaver was almost exterminated back home. Okay, well, if you think beaver dams are amazing, how about the other great miracle of beaverdom? How can a mere rodent cut down a tree the size of this tree? Let me show you a beaver skull, because that's where the answer lies. A beaver skull has, of course, the top part and the lower part, and they articulate like that in a hinge. Let me take the top off here. The top and the bottom teeth are very similar on a beaver. They have incisors at the front of the jaw, and they have one premolar and three molars at the back of each uh, part of the jaw as well. These teeth are the ones that they use to uh, cut down trees with. The yellow material is actually harder than that white material on the back of the tooth, and that allows the back of the tooth to wear away and keeps it in a perfect chisel sort of uh, arrangement that keeps it sharp. And the tooth continues to grow throughout the life of the beaver. Anyway, what they'll do, watch carefully, is they, first of all, they brace the top incisors, and then they chew away with the bottom incisors to chew away at the tree. And if you uh, look carefully, you can see that the teeth match almost perfectly with these grooves in this tree, where they have uh, been cutting away, or teeth very similar to them have been cutting away. Isn't that amazing? This is a big project too, by the way. This is not just one evening's work for a beaver. In fact, they've been going at this for long enough that this grayish looking bunch of tooth marks here is quite old. These brownish tooth marks here are much more recent. I mean, you'd expect that from the fact that they're closer to the center of the tree, but probably beavers come here, you know, a little bit every night or every couple of nights, and eventually this tree will come down. Branches aren't much of a diet, but for every food in nature, there is a digestive system ready to handle it. Okay, let me show you another skull here. This is a uh, porcupine skull, and it looks an awful lot like a beaver skull, but it has much bigger holes here on the front of the face. Same sort of dental arrangement. Incisors up front, premolar and three molars at the back, and a little space in between. Let me show you this too. This is the neat part about rodent skulls. Look at that tooth. Keeps growing throughout the life of the animal. Lots of reserve tooth in there. But you know, porcupines, even though they have the same equipment as beavers, they don't do the same things that beavers do. They don't make dams, they don't cut down trees. And if we had mouse skulls or a squirrel skull, like that squirrel that's chittering over there, they would have almost exactly the same shape as well. They're just smaller. Squirrels and mice, by the way, they'll, they don't just eat plant material. They will also eat a lot of insects and squirrels will even eat small birds, things like that. So they can be carnivores with the same sorts of dentition that beavers use to cut down trees. Aren't you glad beavers are not carnivores? Can you imagine? Carnivorous beavers dragging you into their ponds? Your thought sends a chill through the woodland. And me too. The biggest wet rodent of all is the South American capybara, but giant prehistoric beavers were the size of black bears. Okay, well, while we're waiting for the evening to come along and the beavers to come out and become more active, let's spend just another moment thinking about beaver ponds. Now, beavers are definitely disruptive animals. They're the second most disruptive animal in the northern woods next to people. What with their dams, their lodges, their canals, they are tremendously uh, influential on what the landscape looks like where they live. But think about all the other critters that are benefiting from the existence of beavers. In the water, there's a tremendous variety of uh, water bugs, water beetles. There are any number of species of dragonflies breeding here. There are fish, uh, brook stickleback, brook trout, fathead minnows. There are frogs, there are salamanders, there are muskrats in the water here. And around the beaver pond, various species of birds, bufflehead ducks, uh, uh, song sparrows, there are mallard ducks, there are red-winged blackbirds, there are eastern phoebes. You could make a list of critters the length of your arm, maybe even longer. Depends on what size of print you use. And... 
as this, now this is a very old beaver pond, the one I'm at right now, and it is filling with sediment, as all beaver ponds eventually do. Eventually the beavers will have to move away, the pond will drain away, and you'll be left with a beaver meadow instead of a beaver pond. And in that beaver meadow, plants will grow up in luxurious growth, which will attract various sorts of creatures like, uh, you know, deer and other ungulates. I've even seen moose here in this part of the pond already. Beavers are not destroyers of habitat, they are creators of habitat, and even though their plans may conflict with ours, I think they're a good thing for the woods. Well, let's spend a minute here now talking about beaver beetles. You know, there's a lot of beetles that really, really like beavers for some reason. For example, how about this one? This is Platypetrobus. It's a kind of uh, ground beetle. And these things were discovered way back in, I think it was 1938, and they were very mysterious beetles for many years. There were only a few specimens known, and no one knew where they lived, what their habitat was. Until one entomologist noticed that there was a specimen of Platypetrobus with a mite stuck to it. He had that mite identified. The mite turned out to be a species that uh, also associates with beavers. At that point, my old friend Henri Goulet went out to Meech Lake, Quebec, of all places, and started poking around in a beaver lodge and found 40 of these beetles in the beaver lodge. The mystery was solved. A great ground beetle discovery had been made, and in fact, since then, he and his colleague Yves Bousquet have discovered another sort of ground beetle that only lives in beaver lodges. I think it was a Pterosticus, but I can't remember. But that's not the only sorts of beetles that uh, hang out with beavers. How about this one? I don't have a specimen, but I can show you a picture. This is Platycillus, the beaver louse. This beetle is so weird that when it was first discovered, it was named as a new species of flea, and then it was called a new order of insects, and a whole new group. Now, you know, they, you folks at home might have a little trouble separating your beetles from your fleas, but these were professional entomologists. They should have been able to figure it out. This beetle has been evolving in beaver fur for so long that it, it looks like a flea. It doesn't look like a beetle anymore, but it is a beetle nonetheless. Weird or what? And here's a close relative, Leptinillus, another very closely related uh, beetle that lives entirely in the fur of beetles, or beavers, these are beetles, they live in the fur of beavers, and uh, you know what they eat their entire life, their diet? Beaver dandruff. <sniffs> you ever see a beaver with dandruff? Never. That's why. Those guys eat it. Go figure. Okay, it's time to go looking for the big wet rodents themselves. All you have to do, go back to your beaver pond, bring your binoculars, find a good lookout spot and make sure to put on your mosquito repellent beforehand because you don't want to be making a lot of quick motions that will spook the beavers. Let's go check it out. Well, one good thing about beavers and muskrats, they seem to be quite short-sighted and uh, they also become preoccupied with what they're doing so that if you remain quiet you can usually watch them for some time without them seeming to notice that you're there. It's a mistake to watch the lodge because the beavers come out underwater from the lodge and they'll pop out over in other parts of the pond. And most of what you see when you're watching beavers is the sort of thing that we're seeing right now. And that is a little furry head swimming around in the water. You might or might not notice that the nostrils have valves on them and they can close them when they want to uh, dive underwater. Their ears have valves and of course their eyes have valves too, just like ours. See? Valve on the eye so that when they get uh, underwater, they're more or less completely protected. I should say, though, that they do have a special thing on their eye, a little membrane that flips up and gives them an added, uh, added bit of protection. Now, they're, uh, you know, they've got a lot to do in the average evening's work. They'll swim around, they'll check things out, they're checking me out. You can just tell that they know that I'm here, partly because I'm talking. And, uh, you know, it'll work on the dam, do a little tree chewing, probably eat something itself, because beavers, of course, have to eat. They don't just chew down trees. And uh, 
You never know what you might see. That sort of, sometimes you see air bubbles popping up in a beaver pond. That can either be from a swimming beaver underwater, or it can also be they take branches and they jam them down underwater in a food cache that they will use through the winter. They always have to get it into deep water so that it won't be frozen by the ice. Oh, have a look at this. This one's coming up out of the water. Ooh, you can see just how big they are. Wonderful, huge, chunky animals. And there's that, uh, that big, flat tail that, uh, that they use mostly to slap the water to warn other beavers that there might be some danger in the area. They don't really use it as a rudder very much, and they never use it to spread mud around on the dam like some people think they do. Oh, well, there you go. You see, you make too much noise, they slap the tail on the water. That warns the other beavers in the colony that somebody's here. Ah, you can just watch beavers for hours. You know, the weirdest thing I ever saw was a beaver walking on two legs, on the hind legs, carrying a big armful of muck in its front paws. I'll bet you that's where a lot of reports of Sasquatch and Bigfoot come from. People seeing beavers walking upright. Poor lighting conditions. Sometimes hard to tell the difference. At least it's possible. There was a time in Canada when people were not here When muskrats and the beavers did their thing without much fear On every pond, on every stream, on every river wide They cut down sticks, they piled them up, and then they went inside Hooray, hooray, it's big wet rodent day With beavers large and muskrats small We stop to celebrate them all The glory of a beaver dam that makes you say I am Big wet road and fan. There was a time when beavers were extremely in demand. We trapped them for their body hair and took them from the land. We traded them like currency, their numbers did decrease. <sighs> Leaving just a picture on the Canada face and peace. Hooray, hooray, it's big wet road and day. See them as they are A little bit destructive And a bigger bit bizarre A symbol of our nation With their industry and pals We're proud of our wet rodents And the pride is deeply felt
that little guy is a muskrat, which I guess, you know, in all honesty, is a medium wet rodent. Uh, but, you know, muskrats are not just miniature beavers. Even though a beaver can be 10 to 20 times the size of a muskrat, and it's sometimes a little bit difficult to tell the difference between the two when all you see is a little brown head swimming through the water. It's difficult to judge the size of a rodent head with nothing to compare it against besides water. The best thing to do is to remember that beavers have that flat tail at the back muskrats because they are members of the rat and the mouse family. They're true rats. They have a rat tail, a hairless tail, that's actually uh, flattened side to side so that they uh, can use it as a rudder when they swim. There, you see, when it crosses over the log, you can see the tail. The tail is long and slim and uh, not at all like a beaver's tail. I don't know where this critter's going with all that uh, plant material, but they do build mounds that are much like beaver lodges sometimes, you know, two meters across, a meter high, and they'll live up inside just like a beaver, but they don't build them out of uh, sticks and logs, they build them out of reeds and uh, rushes and all those sorts of marsh plant type things that don't require the strength of a beaver to, uh, to cut them down and transport them from place to place. Now, some members of the rat group are tremendous pests, but muskrats, they're very inoffensive creatures. They don't do much harm to people, although people often do harm to them, mostly because of their fur. Beavers and muskrats, they generally get along, and they often live in the same places. Wonderful. Worth celebrating. Muskrats, too. Don't forget them on Big Wet Rodent Day. Not everyone likes beavers, and as they become more common, problems between beavers and people become more common, too. Well, it's always sad when a big celebration comes to an end. And I guess we'll have to wait until next July 26th to celebrate Big Wet Rodent Day once more. But, you know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why didn't we have a nice little tame beaver from the zoo or a beaver pelt or something? I have an admission to make. I'm actually allergic to those critters. I had to deliver a beaver pelt to a uh, friend of mine last year, and man, I sneezed the whole way. So, we've spared you that. Nonetheless, I am still an eat your nut, and I hope you are too. See you next time. Mark it on your calendar. Big wet rodent day. Can you imagine years from now, when you and I are gone, we'll still be celebrating. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. <laughs>